episode of the Match Slip Podcast. My name is Frank Angeloni. I am your host. If you're new to the show, I invite you to check out our latest episode with Atomic Empire with owner Jennifer. And for this episode, where we have Jared from Deck and Dice located in South Carolina. Jared, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm doing well, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Where in South Carolina is your store located? So I am located at the very tip of South Carolina uh, in a little town called Seneca. It's right outside of Clemson. And is your area of Southern uh, Southern Carolina, is it a big area, like in terms of population, or is it a small town? I mean, Clemson, I'm familiar with that town, but not so much where you guys are located. Yeah, no, it's a. Uh, I'm probably five minutes outside of Clemson. It's pretty rural. Uh, rural, if I can talk straight. <laughs> um, I, the city I'm in right now, I think, is a whopping eight thousand, maybe nine thousand people. So, pretty small. How does that factor in in terms of like players coming to the store? Because I'm sure you have your core group of players, but living in a rural area, is that a challenge in terms of recruiting new players to to come to your store? It is just because, you know, we're out in the sticks and um, there's another small town, maybe 10 minutes farther from me called Westminster. Um, There's also an LGS out there. So he's been around for like 10 years, give or take. So he's kind of the the default shop everyone goes to. So me having to like carve out my own little spot has kind of been a, a struggle, but I've been able to do it. So... Do you coordinate with that other store in terms of like, so that you're not running events, say on the same day to, you know, at least give players the ability to go to, you know, one store one day, yours the other day to offset that at all? Uh, 50, 50. Um, we, we're civil, you know, we get along and all that good stuff, but since he is default shop one on one, um, he knows that if I post something and he if he posts something the same day, everyone's going to go to him instead of me. So like that kind of puts a damper on me running a lot of events just because if he wanted to, he could just put his foot down and just completely stop mine. So, Would you say that that's one of the bigger challenges that your store faces? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Most definitely. Is there anything else at the moment outside of, you know, event scheduling, you know, to, to get players in? Um, is there anything else that you're working through at the moment? Uh, no, that's really about it. Um, one of the bigger things he has over me is having just, you know, being there is uh, he's also WPN. So that pretty much attracts all the magic players to the, you know, you get your stuff the week early, you get your flashy little promos and so forth. So like I lose... I don't want to say I lose a lot of Magic players to that, but for lack of better, I do lose a lot to that. Um, so, yeah, that's just something I also struggle with because for some reason, Wizards doesn't like my shop. Like, I am a uh, equivalent equivalent of WPN in every other card game I carry, like Yu-Gi-Oh, Digimon, One Piece, so, and, all, and all, all the other ones, except Magic. Uh been denied like three times so kind of tired of trying (laughs) and this is just for like standard wpn right and this isn't for the wpn premium side of things no no yeah it's just legitimately just standard wpn like they just won't approve me because like my shop was built in 1930 something um so it's it's old it's historic um the floor they don't like because the tiles are all scratchy and all that good stuff. Um, that's actually the main gripe they have with my shop is the floor. Um, and I'm not going to pay like $3,500 to $4,500 to uh, replace a store. I mean, the floor just to get WPN status. So. I was going to say it would seem like a costly investment just to change that one thing that they're griping over. Yeah, it's it's not good. Like... They also tried to hit me with, uh, it still looks like it's under construction because the uh, drywall is like a beige color and they swear up and down that it's just regular old drywall that's thrown up there. So like, you know, I'd also have to repaint everything as well. So. And that's quite a time commitment. And are you you the only person that runs the store? Do you have employees? I have uh, 
two or three minions. Yeah. Um, one of them's my cousin, and then the other two are just kind of like, uh, I guess you could call them volunteers or whatever. They just kind of help whenever they can. Okay, so with that being the scenario, then like it just being the few of you, that would be quite the time commitment to take you away essentially from the business just to invest all this money to fix the things that they're being particular about in order to get the WPN. It seems like almost like a, I guess from and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it almost would seem like a, like not a a business decision. I would imagine that would work in your favor because it would take you away from your day to day. Yeah, most definitely not. I'd have to close the shop for maybe two days or whatever, maybe three, if I were to do everything in one fell swoop. And, uh, you know, I just, I can't do that. So, cause we're already closed Sundays and Mondays anyways. So like I could use two of those days, but if I start picking up another day or whatever, just to knock out some stuff, it would throw a kink in everyone's plans. And that kind of an improvement or whatever is strictly just cosmetic. I'd see no real ROI on that. So, you know, it's it's really hard for me to want to spend that kind of money on cosmetics just to become WPN, to be able to like hold their stuff a week early and all that. I mean, maybe on a long enough timeline, it would end up paying for itself, but I typically end up selling magic stuff anyways. So I don't think it would really help me to be able to sell it a week early, if that makes any sense. I think I would still, yeah, I think I'd still make the same amount regardless of it being a week early or not. So, In your opinion, like, what do you think would make it ROI positive for you to be able to make those changes to invest that money? Do you think it would be something as, and I'm probably oversimplifying, but something as simple as if you had more employees that could take care of what you do day to day to allow you the time to do those changes? Um, maybe, uh, it would, it like with most things though, it kind of just boils down to like the time and money. Um, yeah, like super small shop, like we hang on by a thread. So like, even if I, for some strange reason did magically just come into the money to be able to do what they want me to do, I would rather invest that money back into like, you know, inventory and all that other good stuff versus the cosmetic route. So that makes sense, especially since the product is what delivers the revenue for the business. And you mentioned you're closed on uh, Mondays and Sundays. Is that just due to the amount of players that you've seen come to the store? Like it's, it's not enough of a, um, foot traffic to where it's feasible from a financial standpoint to keep the store open those days? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, like again, it's really small town. Um, Sundays, you know, if you're not around here, if you're not going to church or going to go spend time with family or whatever, you're pretty much just at the house. So Sundays are pretty, pretty dead. Um, Mondays are about the same way too. No one likes to work on a Monday. You know, everyone gets home. They're like, I don't want to go out. So Mondays are pretty dead because uh, my shop is in the middle of downtown and yeah, downtown is just dead on Sundays and Mondays. So I just decided to close up shop too. And what's the origin story of the store from its beginnings to your involvement with it? I guess pretty uh normal. Um, I always kind of wanted to just open an LGS, uh, you know, sling cardboard crack and all that good stuff. Um, it's... Uh, it's just been something I've been wanting to do for a while. I was going to try to do it um, pre-COVID, but then COVID happened. So thankfully that didn't actually happen. Um, so for the past, about two years ago, because we've only been in business about two years, is when I finally uh, sold the, uh, the land I had to just start up the shop. And that's, uh, that's what I did. I, it was just me my own little collection and the money that I made from selling the, the land and boom, here I am. What, what drew you to the business? What made you want to open the LGS? Was it just your fan of, you were a fan of games or what kind of, you know, started that itch for you? Uh, kind of a little bit of what you just said. I'm, I've always been a, I guess a nerd. Um, I've always enjoyed magic, you know, D&D, stuff like that. Uh, dabbled with Warhammer and stuff back in the day. But, uh, like, I guess the one of the main things was that 
and not to like get too deep into stuff or whatever but uh like growing up the growing up experience wasn't that great the household was kind of terrible as far as someone always being drunk and yelling and um like playing magic and D&D and all that was just a way that I could like escape you know I could close my door go in there look at my cards create characters play video games just kind of get lost in it and every time that I would go to my my own local LGS back down in Columbia it was a great way for me to just you know escape the house um so I kind of figured that I'd like to kind of give people the same escape or at least the option, you know, because I know that the, my experience is not special. It's pretty, pretty common. So I figured if I can open my doors to give people a place to just come and escape crap, it's a, it's a win in my book. I, you know, I think it's a great story of how you turned a a negative into a, a positive to, to give yourself that escapism. What, when did you first come into being interested in like magic or, you know, Warhammer or, you know, any, any of these games, how young were you when you first took an interest to it? Uh, let's see, it was 94, maybe give or take. So I would have been 11, about 11 or 12. So you've been playing magic since, uh, it started almost right. I know. I believe it started in ninety three. So you, yeah. you've been there since. You've been with it since the beginning. More or less, yeah. Uh, there was like a a long hiatus there, like maybe a twenty year hiatus, twenty fifteen twenty year hiatus. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because in two thousand two thousand one, my entire collection like got stolen. So that pretty much just killed it for me right there. So. Yeah, but it's it's always been like a, a passion. Like it's just something I've always enjoyed, loved, appreciated, respected, you know. Is it something you still are able to find the time to play today or does the game store kind of consume the time that you could normally have potentially for free time? <sighs> That's a double-edged sword. Because <laughs> <laughs> like there's always time to to play, but like if you – If you look at it as in, like, I'm just going to sit here and, you know, play cards with people or whatever, then, like, the actual work part doesn't get done. If you treat it as in, as, like, this is kind of like a customer service I offer to sit down and play with people and all that good stuff. It's kind of like you're you're working, you know. Um, So, like, it really depends on how you decide to approach it, like... If you just look at it from the, I'm just going to do some work by filling in with this pod over here or whatever, then, you know, you're you're technically working, but you're playing. But if you're just like, you know what, I'm bored. Let me go play a game. Then, you know, you're just playing for fun. So it's, it's like I said, it's, it's a double-edged sword. It's 50-50. It kind of just depends on the scenario. What do you feel are some things that you're doing with the store right now that are working out really well? We're not like a typical shop. Um... We like to call ourselves controlled chaos. We treat everyone like family almost. Like most of our regulars and all that good stuff, they can come behind the counter and get um, binders to look through. They can grab singles. They can go into the fridge and get a drink and all that good stuff, start to tab. And I think like that little approach right there has really hit a chord with a lot of people because most people are so accustomed to a, a shop being almost corporatized you know like this is the rules these are the rules there's no bending of the rules it has to be this way and then when you come into our shop we're like yeah hey that's fine whatever you know um or like you can haggle us with prices and all that good stuff we're pretty flexible and i think a lot of people really enjoy that like once they figure out that you know we we do a lot of flying by the seat of our pants kind of thing like we We have, like, rules and regulations and all that good stuff, but, like, one of my favorite things to say is rules are meant to be bent and not broken. So, like, there's always wiggle room, and I think people really appreciate that, that we're not just rigid. What's an example that you could share of the almost the haggling aspect of it? I I find that really interesting. It's almost like a flashback to way back in time when people would, you know, barter over 
over product. So I'm curious as to what extent that takes place at your store, if you can give an example or two. Uh, it really just depends on how familiar the person is with us. Um, it was Saturday. Um, I had showed up to the shop just to kind of do some random odds and ends while I was feeling okay. And one of our regulars, Drayton, he, uh, he just got into Warhammer. So he was looking to get uh, a big old Imperial Knight. And he was like, man, I really want this knight, but I don't have the money for it. But I have this Yu-Gi-Oh deck here. He was like, you know, it's worth X, Y, Z. He was like, do you mind if we uh, just do an even swap? So, like, I looked at the deck and I was like, you know what, man? Yeah, we can do that. So, like, I just swapped him that big old Imperial Knight that he wanted for his Yu-Gi-Oh deck. And it was done. You know, that's that's kind of the stuff that we do there, you know? When, you know, when I was a kid, Magic and Yu-Gi-Oh, you would see a lot of people doing trades of that nature. I don't see that as much anymore, at least in where I live on Long Island. Um, so it's it's cool to see that that still exists in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. You almost have that, um, almost like it's, um, you know, like an after school club, almost in a way, like where people are just hanging out. I like it though. It's uh, I'm, I'm more of a simpleton. So I kind of, yeah. I like that idea and it's, yeah. it's pretty cool that that's something you've been able to foster there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been working out for us and all that good stuff. Cause you know, if it didn't work out, we wouldn't continue to do it. But like, I, I guess people don't give people the benefit of the benefit of the doubt enough. Um, Cause like most of the people who come into a shop and become regulars, they want that shop to stay there. So they're not really going to do anything that's going to jeopardize, you know, the shop. So if they go to offer you something or whatever, it's it's okay to hackle because they already know that they're probably going to end up losing a little bit of money anyways. So like you already have the upper hand, so you might as well just go ahead and just hear them out and see if it's reasonable or not, you know? Mm -hmm. How difficult in terms of pricing to stay competitive and to be able to make a profit for the store with, with with product in general, do you find that on a daily basis? Because, you know, you always hear, you know, whether it be online or whatever, you know, players always, you know, whether they're complaining about the cost of something, not realizing what you guys pay for on the, on the back end and having to make a profit on it. How do you navigate that delicate balance of trying to figure out how to price products so that you stay competitive, but also that you keep the store running. It's actually kind of easy. It's just a pain in the ass. Um, pardon me. I don't know if I could say that or not, but it's easy. Cause like you can go on TCG and check, you know, prices and all that good stuff yourself. So you can figure that out. Um, then like you have the people who are always kind of like, Oh, well I can get this online for, you know, $3 cheaper. So you just kind of give them this blank stare and be like, really, man, you're going to hassle me over three bucks. What if I just lower it by three bucks and you buy it from me? You know, like that's just one of those things that we do. As long as it's not lower than what we buy it for, we're pretty, pretty good about price matching to our, you know, to what we can. Um, all of my minions pretty much know what our cost basis is for a lot of this stuff. And even some of our people that come in know the cost basis for some of the stuff that comes in. So like when we when we tell them that we have to sell this box for, we'll say, $75 or whatever. And they're like, yeah, but it's going online for 68 And we're like, yeah, 75 final offer. And they're like, okay, that's cool. I understand. So, you know, it's like everyone sees the online world as like the big bad boogeyman of like pricing. <laughs> but like it's 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 a useful tool because you can explain it to people or you can just be like like with my other instance where I'm like really you want to sweat me over three bucks like let me lower it by three bucks if it makes you feel better and then you can see the little gears click in their heads like well it was only three bucks why was I making such a big deal about three bucks and then like the next time they come in they typically don't hassle you again about like a three to a five dollar difference. They just let it go because they kind of just understand that they were just kind of, you know, being unreasonable. So I think it's a good approach that you take with it by, you know, saying you'll lower it because 
it almost fosters like some goodwill from your end, even though you know it may turn out from your side to potentially make nothing on it. So from a selling of single cards, I know you had brought up TCG player as a reference point for pricing. What has your experience been like selling on there? Uh, pretty overly, overwhelmingly positive. It's a good site to use. Um, we have our own little TCG player pro website. We did the struggle bus to actually get that high, but we finally made it. Um, it's really easy. Uh, it's a lot better, I guess, because you can reach the national audience versus just the little people here. So I've not really had many people being like, oh, hey, this didn't show up or, hey, this arrived damaged or whatever. Most people are, you know, good people. Do you have to do any like determination in terms of pricing or does TCG player essentially handle that for you? Yeah, TCG handles the pricing for you. Uh, you can scan everything in on your phone. And then once you import it into your inventory, uh, it automatically like populates the condition, the price, and all that good stuff. And all you have to just all you do is go in and manually hit like add to inventory, and boom, you're done. It's priced and ready to go. That's very convenient. And you mentioned to get your own store that there was a lot you had to do to get to that point. But you're you know obviously it's great that you got to the the point that it is now with the with the TCG store. What was involved in getting to that level that I guess it's a threshold that TCG player has. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not, it doesn't sound like a lot to some other places because like a lot of other LGSs are started with a group of friends or like some kind of like big seed money or whatever. Um, so like them being able to hit the, uh, I, I forget exactly what it is, but it's like a few hundred and, a hundred sales or whatever in X amount of time with, you know, hundred percent positive feedback, et cetera, et cetera. It's easy for them to do because, you know, they've got the inventory to do it. They've got the manpower to do it, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was, it was me, you know, um, which makes it even more impressive. <laughs> thank you. Um, it, it, it was me. And then like halfway through was when I started getting the minions. That's when, you know, my cousin came in and all that good stuff. So like, it wasn't all me, but for the most part it was, um, but it was, it was just a struggle. Cause like I said, it was me packing up everything, me having to like ship out all that good stuff. Um, and then just the inventory was, was an issue because like I said, it was just my collection that started the shop. And then people are reluctant to trade stuff in now just because the the way the secondary market is and has been for probably the last year, year and a half. So that's a whole other struggle and you know, like topic by itself, honestly. Is that all related, I would imagine, to the overprinting of cards? Uh it's the overprinting and the reprinting of cards. Um in a nutshell, people are just tired of seeing their cards being printed to oblivion and their, you know, collections not worth anything anymore. There are a few exceptions, like there's cards that are always going to be like a hundred plus dollars, like Mana Vault or something like that. But like for the most part, you know, doubling season used to be like a sixty, seventy, eighty dollar card, give or take. But it got reprinted twice in a row, so now you can pick up a doubling season for like twenty bucks. <laughs> so like you know it's it's hits like that that make people be like well maybe i should have traded it in a while ago when i could have still had the money you know got good money for it i'm not going to get anything for it now so i'm just going to sit on it is kind of the mentality that i've seen so yeah it hits both not only from the player collecting standpoint but also from the store as well because now you're stuck with not being able to sell that doubling season, for example, at, at a price you once were able to. Yeah, exactly. Like if, you know, I, if I took it in for, we'll say 40 bucks or whatever, I've lost money because I can't sell it at 40 bucks anymore. And that's a big struggle. A lot of shops are having too, is like the secondary market has made everything plummet, like singles, sealed, everything. So like, you know, uh, a lot of shops who had a lot of their net worth in sealed product, They've taken a huge hit too. So it not a lot of everyone's kind of upset now and it's, it's kind of sad. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a rough thing to see. In your opinion, what do you think would be a good like course correction that could be taken that would not only you think make the player base happy from a collector standpoint, but also help yourself and other stores like you to be able to still, you know, to function essentially without having to worry about, um, you know, these constant price fluctuations and, and the dwindling of prices. And I know it's, you know, part of what we said about, you know, the overprinting and the constant reprinting, but that, that almost seems like small bones in, in it all. I'm curious if you see anything like more specific that you feel could be done. Uh, I mean, I think Wizards getting rid of the draft and the set boxes was a good step forward. I don't know how these play play boosters are going to go, to be honest with you. Um, it, w- it needed to be done. Like, there were too many products at launch anyways, so it needed to be done. It needed The fat needed to be trimmed. But with the price points that these play boosters are going to be at, like... On the low end, on my cost, depending on what distributor I go through, they're like 120 ish per box. So that means they're going to be easy 150, 160, 170 or something out on the open market. And players are already, I guess, for a, a good term, price sensitive when it comes to stuff now. And their game just keeps getting more expensive and more expensive and more expensive. So. I think they need to find some kind of a decent middle ground to where like maybe they just maybe bring back draft boxes and collector boxes and the commander decks and that'd be it. I, I don't know. It's just it's it's something that they're trying to fix, it seems, but they're going about it in a really weird way because what Wizards said with their their play boosters thing is yeah, they're killing off two product lines, but what they're charging with this play booster, they're not going to see any kind of dip in revenue because they're charging so much per box for these play boosters. So then the LGS and distributors are left holding the bag there because we don't really know what we can charge and we don't really know what the people are going to want to pay. Like... I know with this first wave, it's going to be like the only option. So whenever the manners of Tarkov or whatever it is that's coming out that where these play boosters start, people are going to buy it because it's going to be the only way to do it. But I don't think it's going to go over well in uh, following sets. I think people are going to be like, yeah, I'm not paying this anymore, so I'm done. You'll then, as the owner get stuck with it just sitting in inventory in that scenario and that's you know just money sitting on the shelf due to and you know out of your control the the pricing related to to purchasing the product yeah and then you've got this big like just buy singles thing that everyone is on which like in the past was great like i understand it i was even rooting for it because everything was printed to hell and back you know singles were plentiful you didn't really have to go buy sealed product if you wanted to If things happen to go the way I think they are, where LGSs aren't buying as much sealed product anyways, just because they're, you know, twice as expensive as they used to be, there's going to be less sealed product out there. And if people aren't buying the sealed product to crack for singles, there's going to be less singles out in the wild. So your singles are going to end up tripling, quadrupling in price. So like even the just buy singles route, in the next year, year and a half is not going to be the way to go. There's got to be some kind of a give there. Like, you know, we don't even know like what kind of the potential ROI is for these play boosters yet. So like, we don't know if it would be beneficial for the shops to just hold on to those and crack them all and just sell them for singles to make our money back or not. You know, we're going to take a quick break from this podcast to talk about our sponsor, Cardboard Shuffle. Cardboard Shuffle was our 10th podcast interview here at the Match Slip with store owner Mark. Mark has expanded his brand and has produced his own card sleeves called Shuffle Shields. Shuffle Shields come in packs of 100 premium matte card sleeves for standard size trading cards. They contain no PVC and are acid-free. 
I have 17 packs of Shuffle Shields card sleeves to give away to listeners of the podcast and followers of the Match Slip on social media. Requests for a free pack of card sleeves shipped for free to you will be processed on a first-come, first-served basis. To receive your free pack of Shuffle Shields, you'll need to send a screenshot that you're following Cardboard Shuffle on Facebook to frankatthematchslip.com. Good luck, and back to the episode. How many sets would you say it'll take to determine whether or not the play booster, like its health-wise in terms of um, its sales, the sales it generates? I'd say it'd probably take them four sets at the most for them to be like, okay, this is this is either working or this is not working. But the crappy part about that is like Wizard sends, sends their stuff to print, you know, a year, year and a half, two years in advance. So like they can't just pull the plug on it as much as they'd like to. They kind of just got to let it run its course and then course correct. That's understandable. It's just, it's, it is odd, like you said, the way that they went about it. I mean, when I look at it from the store standpoint, I know from stores I've spoken with have had, you know, potentially issues running drafts, for example, at the store is one of the events they hold. And draft boosters were the primary way to do that. But everybody liked the set boosters at the time more. So they create the play booster to try to ac- accomplish both things in one. I'm curious, like from, from your standpoint, do you think that this will improve draft at your store and does draft run at a consistent basis at your store? Uh, no, it doesn't just because the before mentioned shop, you know, next town over, if I run a draft, he runs a draft and everyone goes there. So like, I don't do drafts or anything in my shop anymore. I, I got tired of trying to fire drafts and then everyone going over there. Because, again, he's WPN, so he's got all these little, like, free prize support packs to give out and all that. And that's, I hate to say it, but that's, like, your bare bones, typical Magic players. Ooh, shiny. And then that's where they go. So, you know, like, I'm not faulting them. It's just, like, what the hell, guys? Really? So. Yeah, and it's because it's um, drawing them to the free thing. If they go and play at a certain yeah, location, yeah. I, I, I know what you mean. I get it. It's uh, it's unfortunate because it sounds like I, I think you're cultivating a unique experience, though, for players with the way you're doing things in a less rigid manner, more of a family mm-hmm. way. Was that always your uh, what you envisioned when you opened the store? Yeah, pretty much, man. Because um, like everyone, like I said before, everyone is hesitant to give people like the benefit of the doubt. But the vast majority of people don't want to screw you over. Like they really don't. They just kind of want to go somewhere, have a good time, pay a reasonable price for something, you know, feel like they're, I I don't know, for lack of a better term, like safe or something and just, you know, enjoy themselves. Like, that's kind of what I wanted to do, and that's more or less what I've accomplished so far. And and to accomplish what you've built with with your store, how many hours are you putting in a week? Because I'm sure with with you know the small team you have, and even in the early days when you were doing it, you know all yourself. Mm-hmm. How many hours these days, when looking back, are you doing now compared to then? Uh, so when I first started, I was holding down a full-time job on top of the shop. So, yeah, it was literally like 80, 85 hours a week, easy. Um, And now it's gotten to the point where, or it seems like it, you know, knock on wood, that uh, I can keep this part-time job I have now and spend most of my time at the shop. So that's kind of killed it from the 80, 85 hours a week to, you know, 40, 45 50, somewhere around there. So it's brought it down to a more manageable level, which is, which is great. But, um, you know, I'm still at the shop, like easily six days a week, even on days we're closed. I'm there, you know, cleaning up, inventorying, um, putting together, uh, orders, uh, making videos, you know, talking to people, etc. Like you, you never really stop. <laughs> Right. You, you can't really turn it off. It's it's always there in the background. You mentioned you make 
videos? Like, is, are you doing this on YouTube, like as a, as a marketing tool for the store? Uh, not really marketing, really. It's uh, just like me and the minions. Um, I do this, or I've been doing this thing uh, at the end of each week, usually on Sundays, called uh, Ramblings of an LGS Owner. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I basically just kind of like touch on stuff that happened throughout the week as far as like, you know, the magic world and all that give my little two cents because you know everyone's got it and uh that's pretty much about it and then we do these every monday we do this thing called cards after dark where it's just me and the minions uh playing commander or digimon or whatever and we just record it and have a good old time so that's really cool man do you, do you put it on on youtube like for people to to watch or is it something more for just like for the people within the store oh no we throw it up on youtube um you know, just for, for S's and G's, like we don't, yeah. we, yeah, we don't really expect anything to like take off or whatever. We're just kind of like, Hey, this is, this is us being dumb here. Watch it. You know? <laughs> so yeah. That's great though. I, I like it. It shows, it shows the camaraderie yeah. amongst, uh, amongst you and, and the people you work yeah, with. Yeah, definitely. And like, we let the, uh, the customers and stuff make videos too, if they want to like, uh, a lot of the Yu-Gi-Oh uh, deck tech stuff that we have on the YouTube channel are are Yu-Gi-Oh players making the videos themselves and being like, "Hey, man, here, put this up on the channel." Okay, so like you know, it gets the community involved and all that good stuff. And again, that harkens back to my like, we're not a rigid corporate, you know, rules are rules kind of thing. We're pretty much like a okay, that sounds cool. Let's do it. You know. Mm hmm. Yeah, I really like what you're doing, Jared. I think it sounds like a like a just an awesome like essentially family environment that that you've created amongst not only your employees but with with the customers as mm -hmm. well. From a from an in, like an intentional marketing standpoint, even though I do feel like what you're doing and putting it up on YouTube with the videos does essentially serve as a as a marketing aspect as well. Um, even though it is for fun, what are some intentional marketing? related things you do in your area since it is a rural area to try to reach potential players. I know you have the offsetting of that WPN store, but like if you were just targeting those in your area, what are some things that you try to do? So I, I usually focus more on my town and towards like the Greenville area. I know that means nothing to you, but like it's in the opposite direction of where the other shop is because he gets a lot of stuff from, from Georgia. So I try to focus my marketing, you know, away from where he is because, you know, he's already got that area. Um, so like I run Facebook ads and all that good stuff. I've got a lot of my players for like Yu-Gi-Oh, Digimon, Magic and all that are actual like Clemson students. So they're constantly telling people about the shop on campus and uh, some of them even put up flyers and all that good stuff. Um, I'm in talks with some of the Clemson people to be able to like bring my Commander League Fridays over to the campus itself because a lot of those kids like they don't have cars. So, so they're like right, they're stuck there <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so they're like man we'd love to come out but um we ain't got no ride it's like oh okay so like i'm trying to figure out a way to like remedy that you know but then like that comes with its own little hurdles because then i gotta split up me and the minions if we start doing that on fridays at the shop and on campus so you know it's just something we'll figure out but it's it's in the works you know I hope it works out. That sounds like a fantastic idea. I mean, it, it'll bring your store to a, a wider audience, even though they may not be able to get to your store. At least you can go to them. Mm hmm. Yep. And with, uh, you know, mobile stuff, um, like our system has mobile payments and all that. So like I could technically do a little pop up shop out there on Fridays and sell there and at the shop. So, you know, win win. Oh, absolutely. And I'm I'm imagining that there are some things that you'd want to do that are, you know, limited by time. And I know you mentioned in addition to the store, you you do have a part-time job you had mentioned. Is the plan eventually to transition away from the part-time job so that you could focus on the store full time to do anything else that you've had in mind? Um it is, but I don't think that's gonna happen for a while. And I know this this is also a cliche and everything, but like I, I would rather continue doing what I'm doing because I know that what I'm doing is supporting what I'm doing, you know, at the house and at the shop. I'd like to get to the point to where 
I can get at least one or two of the minions, like, I guess, uh, decent paychecks or whatever, before I even start really pulling any real money from the shop. I'd like to make sure that they're they're good to keep doing what they're doing. You know, so like that way, if for some strange reason I might have to pick up another full-time job or whatever, I know that they're at the shop now. Like they're taking care of stuff and I'm paying them appropriately to where they'll feel like, hey, this is my shop. I need to do stuff, you know? So like I probably won't see anything big for a while because my goal is to take care of the minions first and then worry about me. Because if if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, then the shop is okay, you know? I think that's a very noble way to go about it with what you're doing. Take care of the employees first. And, you know, as you grow it, you'll you'll see your return at the point where you're comfortable enough to, you know, essentially, quote unquote, pay yourself from it. But I, I really like the direction that you're, you're taking it. And I even saw um, an interesting thing on your website that you do, like for, you know, people that are, that are to support the store, you, you have something called a corner store member. I was wondering if you could um, talk about that a little. Oh yeah. 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 That's just, uh, that's just something that, uh, I threw out there just, you know, to see if it would stick or whatnot. It's uh just a cool little way. It's like 10 bucks a month for people to just support the shop. Um, cornerstone members get like specific days of the month where I'll run like a 10 or 15% off sale, or they'll get like extra trade in credit. Um, you know, stuff like that. I usually try to do something at least once or twice a month to be like, hey, uh, thanks for giving me $10 a month, you know? So. I, I think that's cool too, because you even do, like if from from that little branding piece to another branding piece I, I saw you had on the, on the site called Focus Play Days. At first, mm -hmm. I, I had, I read a little bit on your site about what that was. And I like the name of that better than just calling it like you see so many people do. It's just like these are the events we're running, and it's very, yeah. it's very like like we've talked about, very rigid, very standard. Um, mm -hmm. So, is there anything you would say that's like unique to what a focus play day would be in your eyes? Um, just that like the focus play days is it's it's like the focus of the day, but it's not necessarily like what you have to come to the shop and play. Like, every day at the shop is, uh, like, a Commander free play day. Like, Commander is the the end-all, be-all of, like, magic formats, and that, that's our thing at the shop. Um, but, like, even if you show up on, like, a Friday where we have our uh, casual Commander League Fridays, there's people that show up on Fridays to play, like, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Digimon while that's going on. So, like, just because it's a daily focus is not doesn't mean that's exclusively what's happening at the shop. Mm -hmm. And it's nice too, that you offer the ability for people to come in and play for free, because I know not every store can, you know, afford to do that. I know you do things a little differently. When did you decide was, I would imagine probably it was from the get go, but I want to let you answer that when mm -hmm. you decided you wanted to have that free play aspect so that if somebody doesn't want to do what the focus play day is, they could do, you know, come and play what they, they wish. Yeah, uh, I, I'd also like to apologize for the website because I know it looks like something from the early 2000s. Oh, that's, that's okay. <laughs> that's all me. I'm a boomer. So uh, yeah, um, Wix only allows you to do so much and I only know so much. So but, um, <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah, the, the free play thing was, was always built in there. Like, again, goes back to the uh, giving people a place to just come and get away from something, you know, like if you wanted to come up there on a on a Thursday where it's the D and D quest board or whatever, but you don't want to play D and D, you just you know want to play Digimon. That's cool. There's probably going to be someone there who wants to play Digimon. So, you know, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about because I've heard in some scenarios with free play space that you know some stores, for example, it may be a, a cost hit for them. To, to offer that rather than, you know, a scheduled, you know, tournament where you pay to enter the tournament. How are you, did you have to do any like finagling in terms of to offset costs to figure out, okay, I, I know this is something I want to offer. How do I do it? No, not really, dude. Um, again, that's one of those things where people just tend to like think the worst of people. If people come into your shop 
and they sit down and just do a bunch of free play, they're probably going to end up buying something from you, be it like a deck box, sleeves, you know, five or six drinks while they're there, which that the drink thing is kind of a thorn in the side because like, you know, the shop doesn't just run on $2 drinks kind of thing. Like we appreciate it, but like, you know, come on. Yeah. It's not the, <laughs> it's not the biggest uh, profit generator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. But like, you know, we have our singles out in the cases and all that good stuff. So like there's been multiple times where people were there for free play and like, they're just sitting there waiting for their turn. And then all of a sudden you see them staring at the case and they're like, I need that card. So they walk over and they just, you know, buy a 15, $20 card. So free play really just kind of helps get butts in the seats. And then sometimes the flowers just arrange themselves. It's a smart marketing uh, approach too, just to get them in there. And then like you're saying that they eventually will buy something. I, I know when I was younger and uh, I would go to my game store at the time, it's sadly not around anymore, but I would go there. They let people play for free, but I did always wind up buying stuff, whether it was packs, whether it was entries into actual tournaments, it, it, it worked mm -hmm. very well. And it seems like it does the same for you as well. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's great. Like, again, that's just one of the many charms of our controlled chaos <laughs> thing. You know, yep. <laughs> you just, you let people do kind of more or less what they want to do. And, you know, like 85, 90% of the time, they typically do the cool thing. So what are you noticing are the most popular games? Cause I saw you hold like TCG, RPG, Warhammer, D and D. What, what's the most popular at the store? That would be a tie between Yu-Gi-Oh and Magic. And what type of numbers do you see in terms of um, people participating? Uh, honestly, almost neck and neck. Um, we'll see a drop in Yu-Gi-Oh right now because the college kids are on their uh, holiday break. But when they come back in January, it'll be 25, 28 people in there for Yu-Gi-Oh. And then on Fridays, it'll be back to 25, 30 people for uh, Commander League. So they're, they're real close. Very cool. And how many people are you seeing for commander nights? Cause I know I always like to get this number from game store owners because I know it's at this point in time, the most popular format for magic. So I'm curious what those numbers are like for commander. So on a typical Friday night, we will get anywhere from, I'd say 22 to 25. But again, once the kids leave for college and holidays and all that good stuff, you'll see that drop down to like 15 or 20. It'll just be like the locals. So yeah, that's that's pretty much, a, a, I guess, an, an average night would be 15 to 20, we'll say, just to kind of keep it simple. This episode of The Match Slip is sponsored by Crash CityCon, Roanoke, Virginia's premier gaming and fan convention. It's tabletop gaming at its best in addition to role-playing games, board games, there are vendors, and so much more. Play with some of the top game masters in the area, enjoy a casual game in their open gaming area, or learn to play games you always wanted to play. Attend Crash City Con August 23rd through the 25th of 2024 at the Berglund Center Special Events Center. You could check out more information at CrashCityCon.com. Do you think it's a positive living in a college, like being near a college town? Because um, I've talked to other stores that have the same thing as you and they pretty much told me it's kind of like a four year cycle because you know, when the students graduate. So I'm curious if, if it's probably a similar scenario for you as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be, um, I kind of was hoping that it wouldn't, but I was just kind of kidding myself. Uh, it, it's going to be that cycle. It's going to be one of those things where like, you know, I'll need to make the vast majority of my money, you know, the, we'll say from August to April-ish. And then like during the summer and all that good stuff is when it's going to be dry, like be struggling for sales. When that's just going to be part of the college town in general. Like, yeah, that's, that's just it. Like you can go into Clemson during the summer and it's like hay bales going down the street compared to when the kids are in school, you know? So. It's almost like, um, opposite forces almost like a complete differentiating factors between school in session and when it's not not surprising but it's it's yep. it's crazy how to like it must feel like to have to deal with that yeah it's 
it's not good. <laughs> it's it's a real pain. Like I would hope it would like, you know, stay stable like pretty much every other business owner does, but that's just uh that's just not the case. So like you just kind of got to keep that little gremlin in the back of your mind every time be like, "Yeah, sales are good now." You just wait 3 months. It's like, "Oh yeah, that's right." Maybe it- it's it's the constant rolling with the punches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also saw that you have local artists that you support in the store. Are these like players of the store that are artists in, in, in addition to being customers? Or are these like like what these people do? Or they're actually professional local artists that you support in the store? Uh, just professional local artists. Um, like Haley's the one that pretty much does most of the stuff there. Um, she just handcrafts like dice bags and paintings and scrunchies and stuff like that. And she was like, hey, can I sell these in your shop? I was like, sure, why not? So <laughs> Haley's got a little bookshelf with like all her stuff on it. And, you know, she peddles her wares out of my shop. Very nice. And how did like how does the play do you find like people being like uh like buying it and whatnot? Like is it does it sell well? Does it like to help both you and, and her? Uh it doesn't sell as well as either of us would like, mm-hmm. like, you know, to be honest. Most of the stuff that sells are her scrunchies and dice bags. Um, but, you know, every little bit helps, I guess. That's still a great thing that you're doing to, you know, to help another fellow local business owner as well. So I, I think it's a it's a very, you know, great thing that you're doing. Thank you. So my one of my final questions is related to the store layout. This is probably one of my favorite questions to ask. If you were to describe the store layout to somebody like me, I walk in the door. How would you paint that picture? One big line. That's pretty much about it. <laughs> it's uh, you walk in, your tables are on your right, your sales area, POS and all that is on your left. And then it's just a straight shot down to where the two bathrooms are. Um, the men's is painted like Super Saiyan Goku 3. The women is Android 19. And then... Off to the right there, you have a little hallway you go into, and in the back is where my 40K tables are. And what is one future plan? You know, I guess we could take the stance of putting money aside. Mm -hmm. What is one thing that you would love to see happen with the store one day? Or a future goal, for example? To have a satellite shop in Clemson itself that would be my goal. Like I don't need a 2000 square foot shop. Like I have now I would settle for a thousand square feet, just somewhere in Clemson. So I can just tap into that little market there. Cause like I said before, it's there. It's just, I got to tap into it. That's, that's my, my goal would be for the shop is to have a nice little satellite shop in Clemson and just, you know, pedal extra wares. How far off would you say that that goal feels at this point in time? It might as well be on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do hope so, it. I do hope it happens for you that you're able to see that to fruition because I think it's a, a fantastic idea. Because you know, if you do have college students at Clemson who maybe say decide to after college is over that they decide to permanently stay in Clemson Mm -hmm. and then they could drive to your store at that point if they can't, you know, do so now using that satellite store seems like a potential, you know, for a future thing as a great way to continue getting that name out about what you're doing. Definitely. And by chance, have you ever done any like conventions, whether local or, or traveling to, to like, you know, whether you're setting up a booth or just to, as another way of getting the name out about the store? Uh, we have done, or we're going to start because we did it this year. The uh, Clemson hosts a welcome back students thing at the beginning of each semester or at the beginning of each school year, my bad. And we participated in that this year. And that brought a crap ton of foot traffic to the shop. So we're probably going to keep doing that. Sounds like a very smart idea. I mean, that that's great to hear that there's something like that that's working. So a lot of the the store, I mean, I know is is word of mouth like m- many small businesses are, but it's cool mm-hmm. to see the unique advantages you have with being near Clemson. Yeah, it's it seems like a big like obstacle, but realistically, it's it's pretty cool. Um, you just got to find little you know chinks in the armor or whatever to just kind of make your move and see what happens. 
Definitely. And as we wrap up here, Jared, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Where could people find out about your shop? What, where would you like them to go to so that they could learn more? Uh, just the website. Um, it's just Dex, D-E-C-K-S, and A-N-D, Dice, D-I-C-E, L-L-C, dot com. I believe that's the, uh, that's the web address. <laughs> I'll be sure and, to put uh, a link in the show notes as well, just in case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there we go. There we go. Uh, from there, they can find all of our socials and all that good stuff. So if they want to, you know, follow us on Facebook or Twitter, Instagram, they can, uh, you know, subscribe to the YouTube channel to watch me and the minions shenanigans on, you know, Mondays and hear me ramble, you know, every Sunday or so yeah, that, that would be great. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks again, Jared, for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thank you. And for everybody else listening, if you'd like to sign up for our newsletter where you could check out the places, the game stores that I visit in person, you could feel free to do so at thematchlip.com slash newsletter. And with that, we'll talk to you all in the next episode. Take care. <laughs>